All right, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Leanne House, Director with Westworld Tours, and joining me this evening to tell you all about this exciting new tour visiting the seventh continent um, is Coral and Kristen. This also means that Westworld Tours now has tours available on all seven continents, which is really exciting. And I don't know about you, um, but Antarctica is on the top of my bucket list. So I can't wait to hear more about this tour from these two ladies who have both been there several times. Uh, so before I turn it over to Coral and Kristen, I have a couple items to mention. And during the presentation, we will have a couple of pop-up polls asking for your participation by making a simple selection. If you are viewing us from Facebook, you won't be able to see the polls, but you can type your comments into the uh, comment section. And I'll just bring up our first poll. And it is um, if you'd like to sign up for our email newsletter. And so you'll receive invites to future presentations as well as timely information on new tours. We won't inundate you with new with emails um, and you can unsubscribe at any time. So if you um, are signed up already, you can let us know and or you can sign up for our Women Explorers and Westworld or just the Westworld or just Women Explorers. All right, looks like several of you are already getting our newsletter, so that's great. Okay, so I'm just gonna end that poll there. Perfect, thank you. All right, now we encourage you to ask questions at any time throughout the presentation. And that being said, we have everyone on mute. Um, and to ask a question, please type your questions into the Q&A box located at the bottom mm -hmm. or top of your screen. And uh, if you've joined us from Facebook, you won't be able to use the, the Q&A box, but you can type your questions into the comments and we will try to get to all of those at the end of the presentation. So a little bit about us. As Western Canada's premier tour company, Westworld Tours has been serving Canadians from coast to coast with escorted travel throughout North America and around the world, all seven continents since 2000. And we celebrated our 20th anniversary last year, presenting quality components, including modern comfortable coaches, professional tour directors, experienced courteous drivers, baggage handling, and excellent accommodations. We take in all the important sites and attractions and include several meals throughout. Thousands of passengers have chosen our first class style of touring, enjoying the great value, security, and stress-free environment, all while making new friendships along the way. We know our tour directors enjoy getting to know you while on tour and love to see familiar faces. And speaking of this, I'm going to launch our second poll now. How many of you this evening have traveled with us before? I'll just pop that up there now. Um, so anyone watching uh, on Facebook, you can type yes, you've traveled with us before or no, if you haven't. And um, we'll see what everyone says here. So it's looking about 50-50. Okay, I'll just, uh, looks like 51% of you have traveled with us before and 49 have not. So to those of you who have not traveled with us before, welcome. Uh, we look forward to meeting you on board. And to those that have traveled with us, welcome back. We look forward to welcoming you back on board once again. And Westworld Tours is proud to have provided refunds in full to all of our travelers affected by canceled tours due to COVID-19. After all, you should decide when and where to travel, not us. Now, having said, having your travel plans canceled and not knowing when you might be able to travel again is disheartening enough. And we all know COVID-19 has changed today's world, but Westworld Tours remains committed to the well-being of our travelers and our team. We are doing all that we can to adapt to the new requirements and expectations and have enhanced our already robust health and safety protocols to keep everyone safe and healthy while traveling with us. And we ask that you visit our website for the most up-to-date travel uh, and COVID-19 information and travel policies. And we have a couple upcoming presentations and we hope that you are able to join us for our last two of the year. Next week on November 17th, you will hear all about our new tour to the Pacific Northwest. And uh, the week after on November 24th, join us as we share a little bit more about our company, Westworld Tours, and we'll give you a brief overview of all of the tours that we offer. If you've missed any of our previous live 
live presentations. We have them all available for viewing at your leisure on our website at westworldtours.com. Now let's get on to uh, Antarctica. So I am pleased to introduce you to Coral Romanchuk, Senior Tour Director with Westworld Tours. Coral has been with Westworld Tours for over 20 years and has traveled the globe extensively, stepping foot on all seven continents, bringing a wealth of knowledge and experience to her role as Senior Tour Director and showing guests the world. And we also have Kristen joining us from Hertegruden. Kristen started her career in the travel industry just over or over 15 years ago, working as a real life Julie McCoy on Princess Cruises. She was a master of line dancing, napkin folding, and game show hosting, all while cruising the world. That sounds exciting. <laughs> she eventually traded in her sea legs to become an independent travel consultant specializing in cruising. And today she has worked her way up to sales director with Herda Gruden Expeditions, growing partnerships and sharing her love and inspiration for expedition cruising with fellow Canadians. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Very excited about being part of the show this evening. Thanks, Leanne. <laughs> okay, so let's get on with it then. Um, so our Antarctica and the Falkland Islands with Brazil and Argentina is November 14th to December 6th of 2022. And for many of us, this is the last continent to check off your bucket list. So join Westworld Tours and venture to the Southern Hemisphere on our Antarctica and the Falkland Islands uh, cruise tour. First, get to know Rio de Janeiro, de Janeiro, the famous Brazilian seaside town during a full city tour. Of course, no visit to Brazil and Argentina is complete without a stop at the world's large or at the largest waterfall in the world, Iguazu Falls, exploring both sides of this magnificent UNESCO World Heritage Site. And our last stop before boarding your base camp at sea is known as the Paris of the South, Buenos Aires, rich in historical sites, boasting renowned architecture, world-class cuisine, and vibrant entertainment. Your, enter or your expedition departs from the end of the world, Ushuaia, located on the southernmost tip of South America. This journey takes you across the famous, or sometimes infamous, Drake Passage down to the seventh continent. Antarctica landscapes stretch as far as the eye can see and a gorgeous world sealed by pristine snow and ice. Your days will be filled with landings, hiking, ice cruising, wildlife viewing, and optional excursions. Returning north, saying goodbye to Antarctica, crossing the Drake Passage once again and making your way to the remote Falkland Islands, taking in, the, taking in beauty in its purest form, and then heading home, bringing with you the extraordinary memories of your adventure in Antarctica and South America. And now I will pass it on to Coral. All right, thank you so much, Leanne. Uh, it really is a, a genuine pleasure to be here with you this evening, everyone. Uh, as Leanne said, uh, we are extremely excited about this uh, tour. Uh, coming up uh, late in 2022. Uh, this is something uh, new and quite exotic for Westworld Tours. And uh, I was very, very excited to be a part of this presentation because I have been blessed with the opportunity uh, to travel to Antarctica. It's some years ago since I was there, but uh, the memories I have from my experiences uh, on the uh, seventh continent are some of the uh, most profound travel memories that I have in my life. And I still have so many stories that I love sharing uh, about my experiences. Um, very exciting though, we have a fantastic tour planned for you. Uh, and uh, we're gonna be visiting South America, of course, on our way down uh, to the seventh continent. Uh, we're gonna be spending some time in uh, Brazil to start and then making our way over to Argentina before we do arrive in the southernmost uh, city of uh, Ushuaia. Uh, listed in front of you now, uh, you have some of the uh, tour highlights 
uh, on the land portion of the tour as well of our as well as our crews with Herta Gruten. So uh, you see them all listed in front of you, city tour, uh, various sites throughout Brazil that we're going to be talking about shortly, uh, and then our stay in uh, Argentina, incredible Iguazu Falls, the largest waterfall in the world, a uh, beautiful city of Buenos Aires, and uh, then of course, um, Kirsten will be telling you all about the Antarctic uh, portion of the tour, and uh, you're looking at the beautiful Celeron steps in that slide there as well. We'll get to that in a short while. Uh, everyone loves a good map and it's always fun to kind of get a bit of a visual for the routing and for the itinerary on any tour. So we begin our trip by flying down to Rio de Janeiro and uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, certainly is uh, the largest city by population in uh, the uh, in this in the uh, country, excuse me, of Brazil. Um, it is actually uh, has the second largest Portuguese population outside of the city of Lisbon uh, in Portugal. Uh, Rio de Janeiro was uh, was actually founded uh, by the Portuguese. So uh, we'll tell you more about that. Uh, from Rio de Janeiro, we will make our way uh, flying to Iguazu Falls and then down to the city of Buenos Aires. And then finally, that long flight from Buenos Aires down to Ushuaia, where we begin our exped expedition cruise portion of the tour. Thanks, Leanne. Hmm. So Rio de Janeiro, uh, again, uh, settled by the Portuguese uh, back in 1565. Uh, so a little bit unique in South America. I love the continent of South America. Um, I've had opportunities in the past to travel a handful of times in various countries. Um, uh, there's such a vibrancy uh, to South America, the, uh, the culture, the people, the food, the music. There's just something really lively and, uh, and really lovely about this part of the world. So uh, definitely, uh, this is a city that I'm sure many people will be looking forward to uh, to seeing for the first time as well. Uh, it is actually one of the most visited cities in the Southern Hemisphere, in fact. Um, and uh, so founded by the Portuguese, uh, famous for its various beaches uh, like Coca Cabana Beach and uh, certainly famous for, uh, for Carnival as well. So we'll have a welcome dinner in Rio de Janeiro and then uh, the following day we'll be embarking on a city tour as well. Uh, you're looking at uh, some of the uh, the famous attractions in Rio de Janeiro in this shot, everyone. Uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, that is definitely one of the icons of Rio. You're looking at Sugarloaf Mountain. And uh, Sugarloaf Mountain rises 1,300 feet above sea level. Uh, it uh, sits at the mouth of Guana Guanabaro Bay. And uh, so we'll have a, a spectacular opportunity uh, to visit uh, Sugarloaf Mountain. It actually sits on a peninsula uh, jutting out into the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, we will be visiting by cable car. You see the cable car there on the uh, bottom right hand uh, side of your screen. Uh, it's a glass wall cable car, holds 65 passengers and runs along a uh, 4,600 foot route up the mountain. So we'll actually go right to the top of the, uh, the sugar loaf. Uh, but uh, yeah, there are actually several monolithic uh, mountains uh, similar to this made of granite and uh, and quartz that rise straight up from the water's edge around Rio de Janeiro. So uh, certainly the sugar loaf is uh, one of the uh, iconic things that uh, you've certainly seen photos of when you see photos of, uh, of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, they call it the sugar loaf because of its uh, supposed resemblance to a uh, to refined sugar uh, sugar loaf. So uh, hence uh, the sugar loaf mountain. Um, the uh, the view from up there absolutely spectacular, and uh, certainly the cable car is uh, is a fun ride and a nice way to get up there as well too. Um, you're seeing the uh, the cathedral in uh, in the center of the screen too. It's called the Metropolitan uh, Cathedral. Uh, interesting modern style of architecture, uh, unique in that it's uh, designed in a conical shape. So Metropolitan Cathedral will be uh, just another of the attractions that we'll have a chance to see on our city tour of, uh, of Rio. 
Um, it was actually designed uh, with the uh, the Mayan pyramids uh, in uh, in consideration. So, uh, hence the unique uh, unique uh, design to uh, to the cathedral. Interesting story, everyone. Uh, the steps on the right hand side of the screen, the uh, Celeron steps uh, that we'll have a chance to visit as well. Uh, it was actually a gentleman named Jorge Celeron who started building these beautiful ceramic glass tile steps. It started on a whim not that many years ago. It was actually just back in 1990 uh, that Jorge Celeron decided to, uh, to uh, make glass tile uh, steps outside of his home just to make it look prettier. Uh, he was born back in 1947. He was Chilean by birth, uh, but settled in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, he had worked as both a painter and a sculptor in over 50 different countries. And uh, uh, he uh, didn't live to be an old man, unfortunately. It's a fascinating story of the artwork he created. And when he passed away in 2013, they actually found him uh, laying on his, uh, on his steps one day. Uh, but the steps have become a truly an iconic tour attraction in, uh, in Rio de Janeiro. So, uh, yeah, we'll have a chance to see that as well. 215 steps up to the top, uh, measuring 125 meters long and over 2000 tiles that he originally collected and scavenged from construction sites and, uh, and urban waste. And then once his project caught on, uh, they've actually been featured in, uh, in music videos and in movies as well. Uh, once the work caught on and people realized how beautiful his work was that he was, was doing, people began sending him ceramic tiles from all over the world. So uh, ceramic tiles from uh, over 60 countries make up the Celeron steps in Rio de Janeiro. So that's just a few of the attractions that we'll see on our city tour. Uh, moving on, uh, certainly another one of the attractions that uh, we associate with Rio de Janeiro, and I think for any of us, when uh, we think about uh, about this country and this city, we can't help but think about Cristo Redante or Christ the Redeemer, and uh, that is the famous statue that you're seeing on the bottom right-hand corner of your, of your screen right now. It's an Art Deco statue uh, created of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Um, it is not 98 feet tall and sits on top of a 26 foot tall pedestal. As for the dimensions of Christ the Redeemer, uh, 98 feet, uh, the arms stretch 92 feet across. And uh, it was built back between 1922 and 1931 on Corcovado Mountain. It's actually made of soapstone, uh, soapstone and, uh, and concrete. Uh, interesting stories about the renovations it has gone through as well to uh, lightning rods and such to protect it uh, up there on top of the mountain. Uh, but we'll have a chance to be up close and personal to the statue of Christ the Redeemer uh, when we visit on the uh, COG, uh, the COG railway. So you can see a shot of that on uh, the left hand side of your screen. So a COG wheel train uh, takes us to the top and up through the uh, Tiwaka rainforest as well. So it is a symbol of uh, Christianity worldwide and very much it is a symbol both of uh, the country of Brazil and uh, the city of Rio de Janeiro. Not only that, uh, one more interesting thing finally about uh, Christ the Redeemer is uh, it was declared one of the new seven wonders of the world. Of course, you have the ancient seven wonders, you have the natural seven wonders, you have the new seven wonders as well, and, uh, and Christ the Redeemer is considered to be one of those seven new wonders of the world. Hmm. And uh, moving on, everyone. Um, so uh, from this point, uh, we uh, we will be making our way um, on a lovely boat cruise. Uh, we have a two-hour cruise planned for you on uh, Guanabara Bay. So it is a, is a cruise by schooner. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to see those famous beaches of Rio de Janeiro, Sugarloaf Mountain, all from a water perspective this time. So we have that to look forward to. Um, Guanabara Bay uh, means the, the bosom of the sea. 
So uh, we'll take a ride on the bosom of the sea. And uh, from that perspective, we'll have a chance to uh, see the uh, the famous bridge on the bottom left-hand corner, as well as Sao Zhao Fortress, uh, which was built in 1555 to, uh, to protect the city. So two hour crews to look forward to. And uh, we'll be making our way to Samba. But uh, another thing that we're going to learn about during our stay in Brazil is something else that we associate very much with this country and certainly with uh, Rio de Janeiro, and that is Carnival. So uh, we'll have a chance to learn all about Carnival. So uh, you're just seeing a shot of that on the right hand side of your screen. And uh, then from there, um, making your way to, uh, to Samba. And uh, from there, uh, we're going to be visiting what is uh, an incredible uh, natural phenomenon. And uh, this is indeed the largest waterfalls in the world. Uh, they are very much visible from both Brazil and Argentina. The majority of the river itself runs through Brazil. Uh, the majority of the waterfall is actually on the Argentinian uh, side, but together, the two sides make up the largest waterfall in the world. So this is magnificent Iguazu Falls. So we'll be flying to Iguazu, uh, making our way there, and then having a chance to uh, to tour and uh, and also to really appreciate uh, the magnificent views from the platform, such as you're seeing on the um, on the uh, bottom left hand side of your screen. Um, the bird sanctuary as well. Uh, we'll have a chance to enjoy that uh, eight meter tall uh, forest aviary filled with birds uh, that are indigenous to that part of the world and also from many countries around the world. So over 500 uh, birds in the uh, in the aviaries there as well. So we'll see that. And uh, then the Makuko jungle, uh, we'll be doing an open uh, Jeep tour. Uh, that's what you're seeing in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. So a chance to uh, enjoy the jungle as well as the incredible, incredible natural beauty of Iguazu Falls. And then uh, just a couple more shots here as well before uh, we move on to Buenos Aires. Uh, just some more shots to uh, to show you some of the perspectives you'll have. Uh, not only that, impressive thing about visiting Iguazu is just how close you can get. Uh, quite literally, just uh, just a hand touch away from uh, from the waterfalls. And then from Iguazu, we make our way to the city of Buenos Aires. Um, Buenos Aires is, uh, as Leanne was saying, uh, the Paris of the South, or specifically uh, the Paris of South America, uh, known for its uh, European uh, type of architecture, uh, European culture as well. Uh, we'll visit some of the, uh, the highlights of the cities and have a city tour of, uh, of Buenos Aires as well, uh, seeing, um, seeing some of the attractions, which I believe are coming up in the uh, next Next slide. By the way, Buenos Aires means fair winds. So now we're uh, we're back uh, in a Spanish-speaking country, uh, unlike uh, Brazil, primarily Portuguese, of course. Uh, this is very much a Spanish-speaking country uh, down at the bottom of uh, South America, and uh, in Argentina, uh, certainly this is a, kind of a, a, a real European feel in uh, in South America. Uh, I was really pleased to see that Leanne had included that slide uh, taken in. Uh, La Boca on the left hand side of the screen. I actually have some lovely memories myself of spending time in Buenos Aires. Um, I was just telling the girls before we went live about an experience I had where I'd stopped, uh, been shopping and walking and sightseeing all day in Buenos Aires and I uh, just stopped to uh, have a cold beverage in one of the cute little uh, patio bars you can just see in the bottom left hand corner and uh, an older gentleman um, probably in his 80s didn't speak any English uh, at all and my Spanish wasn't very good either uh, just grabbed me away from my seat and started dancing with me and trying to do the tango with me so it's just a lovely memory I have uh, from my stay in uh, in Buenos Aires but uh, it really is a beautiful city and uh, we'll have a chance to see some of the neighborhoods uh, like uh, like the um, uh, uh, the La Boca district uh, in uh, Caminito as well as uh, San Temo um, the uh, famous obelisk you see in the bottom right hand corner of your screen as well and plus 
Plaza del Mayo, the center of the city. And the top right hand corner of the screen, uh, this is absolutely incredible. We'll have an opportunity to take you to a tango show in Buenos Aires. And I think of all the live music shows and live dance shows I've ever seen in my life, uh, the show that I saw of the tango in Buenos Aires on my on my last trip, my, my first trip to Buenos Aires uh, some years ago now, was the most enchanting, riveting live dance show I've ever seen. There's something incredible, sen incredibly sensual about the uh, the tango. It really is uh, a very, very beautiful dance that you can't, you just can't look away. It's, uh, it's quite enchanting. So I'm really excited that we'll have a chance to take you to a tango show as well. And then we're not quite finished with the land portion yet. Uh, we'll make our way out uh, to the, uh, the Tigre uh, River. And uh, we're going to have a lovely uh, boat cruise as well in the uh, Piranha River Delta. Um, it, the word kind of looks like tiger, T-I-G-R-E, uh, the pronunciation tigre, although interestingly enough, uh, the name comes from jaguars that were at one time hunted uh, on the river uh, back in the day. But it's a 14,000 foot, excuse me, 14,000 square foot uh, natural wonder. So uh, you're looking at uh, the art museum uh, tigre in the bottom uh, right hand corner of your screen and the uh, Tigre River Cruise itself. So that is just a brief little overlook at some of the highlights that we'll enjoy on the land portion of the tour before we make our way to uh, the magical uh, Antarctica continent. And uh, Kristen has so much to tell you about that. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Coral. Um, I'm just as excited now about the land portion as well. So I think you put together such a great uh, tour package for everybody. Um, so we take over um, the itinerary, I believe it's on day nine. Um, so we are still in Buenos Aires. Um, we do have a an extra night that we include before our uh, cruise package, because of course, we want to ensure that all of our guests safely make it down as a group um, from the major city of Buenos Aires down to Ushuaia at the bottom of the world where you will meet our ship, the MS Roel Amundsen. So we actually have a charter flight um, with uh, our Herta group and guests. And so everybody will be transported together um, to the airport and uh, flown down to Ushuaia where we will of course transfer you to the ship so that everybody boards together. And part of the reason we do this is of course because, you know, you might be familiar with other cruise experiences where perhaps maybe if you had some sort of flight delay or issue, um, you know, maybe you missed catching a ship in, um, you know, Miami, but perhaps you can actually hop on a flight and catch it at another port, you know, flying into NASA or something like that. When it comes to the nature of Antarctica, of course, once that ship departs Ushuaia, she is gone for good until she comes back at the end of the itinerary. Um, so that's why we make sure we charter our our guests all together on the same flights um, so that everybody arrives and disembarks together um, to make sure that all of our guests have the opportunity to enjoy this amazing destination um, and voyage down to Antarctica. Okay, so we're going to move on. Um, you know, now that we've boarded our ship, we do have a couple days where we, you know, can get settled and comfortable. And um, yes, these are the days where we will we'll be crossing, um, as Leanne said, the infamous Drake pack Passage. And um, there's no joking around about the, about the Drake Passage. Um, we have a saying at Herta Gruten that there is sort of two types of experiences that our guests may go through when crossing the Drake. And um, that is that she may be Drake Lake you know, smooth and calm and beautiful, or she could be Drake Shake, um, because there are multiple different, you know, versions of the ocean that converge um, right at the Drake Passage and can cause some rocky weather. Um, don't worry, Ro Roel Amundsen is built for these conditions. She has fantastic stabilizers on board. Um, but, you know, we, we like to say the Drake Passage is sort of you know, kind of the, the conquering that you go through to get the low hanging fruit at the bottom, which is Antarctica. So during your sea days, you're gonna get to know our expedition team. And of course, at the very beginning, we're gonna outfit you with all of the gear that you're going to be getting um, on board. You can see all of our Heli Hansen expedition jackets all lined up ready here um, for our guests to, uh, to pick from. 
And uh, I will talk a little bit about the gear a bit further on in the presentation. So then, of course, we finally make it down uh, to the amazing continent of Antarctica. And we're going to have several days down here um, with the oppor opportunity to enjoy amazing ice scapes, um, you know, unique and sometimes curious wildlife. As you can see here, this little Adelie penguin that found its way onto one of our zodiacs. And just the opportunity to fully immerse yourself and enjoy this destination in multiple multiple different ways. Um, we do, of course, have the opportunity because of the size of our ship to actually disembark our guests on land in the continent, because that is actually a rule that needs to be followed when down in Antarctica. We'll also have the opportunity to go out in the Zodiacs. We like to call them our explorer boats and go out and do some scenic and ice cruising in and around all of the different ice flows to view all of these different opportunities. And of course, we have right from our own ship the opportunity to sail through some amazing fjords and channels and really just capture you know the amazing beauty and snow-capped mountains um, that are around us as well. So then carrying on, we do have a couple extra days after Antarctica where we will um, make our way back through the Drake Passage up to the Falkland Islands. And of course, during the sea day time, our expedition team is on hand to offer educational lectures throughout the experience to help you further understand, you know, some of the wildlife that we might see when we're down in destination, how some of, you know, the places that we might visit are formed, learn about things and witness it for ourselves, um, you know, issues like climate change and how is all of this affecting um, a place like Antarctica. And after our sea days, um, once we make it up to the Falkland Islands, we're going to have a couple different types of experiences here. Um, so we will visit, this will be the only sort of city that we will be accessing um, during the expedition part of the cruise. So we will have the opportunity to see Port Stanley, um, which is the main um, city center for the Falkland Islands. And um, our ships have the opportunity because of our size um, to dock right here and we can actually walk along that beautiful little um, coastal road into the town and have access to the Maritime Museum that's there. Um, we do, this is the only place where we will have optional shore excursions um, that you can choose to purchase in advance or on board. Um, it's up to you um, because we do have access to some local tour guides in Port Stanley um, where they might take us a little bit further afield and um, potentially if you took um, our Blue Cove Lagoon tour, um, that may be the only chance on this itinerary where you might see the king penguin, um, because the only other place where they reside in Antarctica, um, it's a sub-Antarctic island called South Georgia. Um, so on this itinerary, the only hope of potentially seeing that king penguin is potentially on one of our shore excursions um, that's available through uh, Port Stanley um, at, in the Falklands. And then we will have a couple other days where we will do landings on uninhabited islands as well. Or there might be, you know, maybe just a couple or a family that lives on the island where we will have the opportunity to explore around and see some of our, you know, penguin species that we don't typically see on the continent, like the southern rockhopper penguin. Um, it might be the opportunity to go and view some of the waved albatross nesting areas. And um, again, just sort of an alternate um, type of experience that we can really kind of get off the beaten path and re re um, enjoy um, viewing this remote wildlife that lives in these parts of the Falkland Islands that are generally not visited um, by tourists. And then after the Falkland Islands, we just have one more day at sea. Um, so it's kind of a nice debrief and sort of just a nice way to sort of recap, um, you know, what we've been experiencing and what we've seen. And our photographer that's on board, they like to put together a little slideshow for our guests and show it at the end so you can see 
you know, all of the amazing places that we had the opportunity um, to view throughout our expedition. Uh, before we finish back off in Ushuaia, and um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, everybody disembarks together, and then we fly everybody back um, to the main city of Buenos Aires. So I am just going to go a little bit into sort of what Antarctica is all about. You know, you have obviously maybe seen some documentaries on TV, witnessed some amazing photographs, maybe in books or magazines or online. And um, the funny thing is, I really don't think sometimes photos do this destination justice. It is, as Coral said, an absolutely magical, magical place to go. Um, and it is also known as being the coldest, windiest, highest, driest continent on Earth. Um, you're probably wondering why the heck then would I want to go down there? Uh, but don't worry, we do travel to Antarctica during the Antarctic summer. And I think as Canadians, we'll find, um, you know, the temperatures are, are pretty comfortable and uh, easy for us to get along with when we're down in this incredible destination. So why go to Antarctica? Um, really, it is just one of those unique places where very little of the world's population have had the opportunity to travel. Um, and it could be for you that seventh continent that you need to tick off yourself. Um, for me, it was my seventh continent and I had the opportunity um, to travel uh, to this destination in March of last year. So it was the last trip I've had and um, you know, just some of the best memories um, of anywhere I have traveled in it gives gives our guests sort of that opportunity to connect with that spirit of exploration because there is so much polar history and exploration history in this destination and of course the very ship that you will be traveling on the MS Roel Amundsen he was essentially in his race against Scott to be the first to make it down to the South Pole um, so he has a lot of polar heritage and expertise in these regions and we'll learn about those those types of famed Norwegian explorers throughout the experience as well, since we are a Norwegian company. But I think first and foremost, you know, when thinking about going to a place like Antarctica, it's understanding that, you know, it's all about traveling on, um, you know, flexible terms and traveling with an open mind and being prepared to experience nature on nature's own terms. Um, Mother Nature is 100% in control in a place like Antarctica. So it is up to us and our skilled and um, expedition team to make sure that, you know, we adjust our plan to go along with the opportunities of wildlife viewing and making sure that safety is, of course, the number one priority when we are in destination. So why travel to a place like Antarctica with Hurtigruten Expeditions? Um, well, what you may not know and what I think is a pretty cool fact is we have actually been at the expedition concept of cruising since 1896. We led the first expedition cruise um, from Norway up to the high Arctic of Svalbard. Um, and we actually started as a company just three years prior to that in 1893. We have a lot of polar experience and uh, you know, Antarctica is just one of the areas that we love to share that passion and that pioneering for the polar region regions with our guests. We are also an industry leader when it comes to sustainable travel. Um, this beauty here, the MS Rowell Amundsen and her sister ship, the MS Fridjof Nansen are the world's first hybrid electric powered ships. And we're actually just a couple weeks ago named the most sustainable cruise ships in the world. Um, so we are very proud about that fact. And we were also the first major travel company and cruise line to completely ban single use plastics across our entire fleet back in 2018. And we also like to do things like beach clean initiatives and our guests can choose to forego having their room serviced for a night or two if you wish, it's totally optional. Um, and 
And on your behalf, we will then make a donation to the Herder Gruten Foundation, which works towards supporting global and local initiatives um, for, sustainable, for sustainability. Um, we have beautiful premium purpose-built small ships. They are made truly for these destinations. Um, we like to call them our base camp at sea, probably a little bit more comfortable than the typical base camp you might be thinking of if you were trekking Mount Everest. Um, you know, we've got that premium twist to it. And we have amazing expedition teams who are experts in their field that will really provide educational immersion because we want the experience um, on board our ship to be an extension of the destination. We don't want our ship to totally take away or distract you from where you're sailing because we understand the magic and how special it is um, to really celebrate and um, you know take advantage of the opportunities of where it is that we're sailing. And of course, we do provide you with a very value packed adventure um, for your money. So what comes included in the Herder Gruten expeditions experience. I'll take you through the journey of that right down to, you know, the food, the clothing, the onboard experience, and the on land experience as well. So at the heart of the whole expedition um, is our expedition team. They are your hosts and guides, both on board our ship, during our landing activities and during our ice and scenic cruising activities in our explorer boats as well. We have over 350 expedition team members from around the world, including some Canadians as well. And they're educated science professionals in things like geology, ornithology, which is the study of birds, marine biology, and they all bring a different skill set and knowledge to the table um, to help sort of tie destination themes to um, their knowledge and um, really help our guests fully understand um, where it is that we're traveling from all different angles. And of course, they come highly trained in polar survival. Um, we are active members of the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, which you'll find a little bit more about um, further in the presentation. And um, they actually have to complete, you know, testing with IATO before they can embark on a season in Antarctica, as well as do testing through Hurtigruten expeditions and renew their skills um, from a safety standpoint to make sure that we are highly trained and prepared and ready for a full Antarctic season. Now, in terms of culinary, don't worry, I promise you will never go hungry on a Hurtigruten expedition. Um, but we do like to say that expedition takes priority over meal times. So it is possible that day to day your meal times may shift because, of course, we always want to make sure we're taking advantage of the weather conditions while we have them. So that could potentially mean, you know, maybe shifting breakfast a couple hours later one day because we want to ensure we can get everybody out in the morning um, to take advantage while Mother Nature is on our side. Um, so all meals are included as well as an early riser and afternoon treat. Um, we do have coffee, tea. did want to make it a full all-inclusive um, drink experience you do have the option of purchasing a drink package as well um, gratuities are not expected it's not the Norwegian way of life to tip so we have passed that concept on to our ships as well it's completely at our guest discretion if they choose to leave a gratuity or not um, the onboard activities that we offer um, to sort of help with the overall education of the destination that we're in, our expedition team will lead an in-depth lecture series that will be interspersed, of course, throughout the voyage um, in and around the landings and activities that we will be doing ashore because, of course, we want you to enjoy everything. We are also known um, and what is unique to Hurtigruten Expeditions for our state-of-the-art science centers that are available on board. Um, we 
we do have biological and geological microscopes where maybe we are out in our science boat um, and can collect um, water samples and phytoplankton samples and actually bring them back on board um, to view and blow up onto our screens to really get sort of a deep down look at what it is that we're experiencing, even on the tiniest of level. Um, and amazing that, you know, even in some of the water samples we collect all the way down in Antarctica, we do sometimes find microplastics floating in the water as well. Um, so, you know, we will learn a lot more about how those things are affecting the destinations that we're visiting. There's also casual opportunity to engage and dine with our expedition team as well. It, it's such a great thing to be able to sit down and have a family style meal with them um, to really learn about their life on board and how they came to be, um, you know, expedition team members, maybe after a long career as an ornithologist. We have a professional photographer on board our expedition ship, and they're there to offer um, introductory photo lectures, as we do have a lot of hobbyists and professional photographers like to, who like to travel with us to uh, the amazing destinations we have on offer. And they also, of course, as you heard me mention, um, take photos and videos of the entire voyage while you are on board and compile um, all of them into a nice slideshow at the end of the expedition. We do also provide provide our guests with an expedition logbook that is emailed to everybody about a month after um, the expedition has been experienced. And that includes all of the different wildlife sightings and bird sightings that we have seen. And we also include a selection of the photographers um, sort of highlight photos from your destination as well that you can save um, and download for yourself, maybe for future printing. We do have access to Wi-Fi on board, just keeping in mind, you know, sometimes we are quite remote, so it may be a little spotty at times. Um, but believe me, when you are down in an amazing destination like Antarctica, um, there's probably very little screen time that you will be worrying about um, because there is just so much to view um, around you and, uh, you know, when we are ashore as well. And um, one of the highlights um, during our, our science program is participating in our citizen science activities. So we are partnered with different associations around the world where we essentially aid in the collection of data to help further their research because not every um, association has access to funding to be able to have their own ship down in a place like Antarctica for an entire summer season. Um, so we can work together because we are down there for the entire season and can help with some of the wildlife viewing um, and data collection for them. Um, one of my favorites, I think, is the Happy Whale Program. And how that works is if one of our guests takes a photo of a whale tail, um, which is the same for us as fingerprints, it's their identifying markers, we can actually upload that photo into the Happy Whale database, and it will be able to identify if that whale already exists in the Happy Whale database. And if it does, it will produce all of this information for us to learn about this whale that we've just seen. Um, it will, of course, tell us, you know, the gender of the whale, how old it approximately is, what does its migratory pattern look like, and does it tend to travel with a bigger or a smaller pod? And what's even more cool is if that whale doesn't already exist in the happy whale database, um, our guest who took that photo gets to be the one to name their whale. And that whale will then be entered officially into the happy whale database and will forever live on um, with the name that our guest had provided it. So there's a lot of really cool, neat ways through science um, that we can interact and fully immerse in this amazing place of Antarctica. So of course, in order to comfortably and safely enjoy an expedition in a place like Antarctica, there are certain you know, considerations you wanna take when it comes to the gear that you, um, you know, wear and the type of packing and layering that you do with your clothing. Now we do help with some of that. Um, everybody will receive the Herdegruten expedition jacket. And this is something that we will size for you on board. Um, it is a wind water resistant layer. And sort of the secret for packing for expedition is layering things up because as you become more and less active throughout the voyage, you want to be able to 
you know, add a layer quickly or quickly take one off, um, you know, as you see fit. Because although it is cold in the destination that we visit, you'd be surprised, you know, how much you can actually heat up, um, you know, with the sun beating down on you in, in Antarctica. Um, and also we do provide our guests with the Hurtigruten muck boots. Now this is a requirement when in destination, specifically for biosecurity, which I'll talk a little bit about um, further on. But these are very thick rubber treaded. Um, they've got a neoprene lining to make sure that our guest feet stay warm, stay dry, and it's perfect and totally built and meant for the polar regions. So the boots are on loan from us. You will have a pair for the entire voyage that um, are your own. The jacket will also be a souvenir you can take home with you at the end of the trip, along with um, our Hurtigruten reusable water bottle. And our guests can also have the use of our trekking poles as well. Um, so our expedition team will bring that gear ashore. You can just grab a pair of our trekking poles, use them at the landing site, and then our expedition team will bring all of the gear back to the ship at the end of the expedition. So people are always quite curious to know, um, you know, the process of getting in and out of uh, the Zodiac or the Explorer boat. And the nice thing is um, the way the hull of the Hurtigruten ships are designed is um, the side of the ship actually folds out flat so that it is a water level platform um, that we can just pull our Explorer boats right up to. And of course, we always have helping hands on the platform and in the boat to make sure that it is a smooth and seamless process to get our guests in and out. Um, this is one of those situations where slow and steady wins the race. You know, we're not in a rush to make this happen. We want to make sure that everybody is comfortable and safe um, when going through this process. So we like to equate it sort of like stepping in and out of a bathtub. That's probably the best real life experience um, for what it's like getting in and out of the Zodiacs. And of course, we use this as our main transportation um, for doing our landings and our scenic and ice cruising. So you might see that um, our expedition boats, or you hear me use the term uh, landing, if you can go to the next slide, Leanne, um, you hear us use the term landing and you're probably like, well, what is a landing? Um, now it's a very formal sounding term. Um, so unlike, you know, some of the more populated regions of the world where you can take a cruise and actually get off in a city or in a port, um, when we are down in Antarctica, of course, we have no access to any of that. Um, nobody permanently lives down there. There might just be a few um, research stations that we might have the opportunity to visit. It. Um, but we essentially use the land to disembark our guests and go off and go exploring and do some hiking or do some wildlife viewing. Um, so we are using sort of the natural area around us um, for doing our onshore exploration. So there's a few different types of landings um, that we can do. Um, as you heard me mention, we might have a visit to a research station, and this is where we may encounter a dry landing. So with this, it could be that we are just stepping out onto a little platform or a little dock um, that they have at uh, the research station. And more commonly, we tend to experience a wet landing, um, or when we are in warmer climates, um, we call them beach landings as well. Now, a wet landing is exactly as this photo shows you. We are just pulling right up um, and onto the beach area or the ground area, and it is possible that our guests may have to step in and out of the water, kind of the shift and, and roll um, opportunity with your body to get in and out of the boats. And you can see why those muck boots become in handy because of course we don't want you to get your own boots and shoes and things like that wet in destination, um, but our boots can stand up to the test no problem when we are doing our wet landings. And then, of course, um, the final type of landing, which you will experience a lot of, especially because of traveling towards the beginning of the Antarctic season, is the polar landing. Now, you're probably thinking, well, we're in the polar region the whole time. Why isn't every landing a polar landing? Um, as the seasons in Antarctica go on, it is actually quite common that the landing sites do lose some of their snow and do melt um, so that you may not see quite as much snow that you see in this photo here. Um, but our expedition 
team will go ashore first and you know create sort of a safe landing area that we are able to disembark our guests from. You can see here they actually used a shovel um, to create sort of a set of stairs in the snow and ice so that we can comfortably and safely disembark our guests onto the landing site. And then some of the perks of, you know, getting kind of up close and water level in our zodiacs is that opportunity um, to really see those icebergs, um, you know, for the size that they really are. It's amazing how small you can feel um, when you are up against something like this massive iceberg that you see here. And of course, you know, we always do this maintaining a safe distance because it is common that, you know, chunks can break off of these icebergs and the ice icebergs themselves can roll and shift in the water. Um, so we do these viewings cautiously, but it does give us a great opportunity to be at water level and enjoying, you know, the ice a little bit more up close. And if we're lucky, um, you know, we may have a whale encounter or two, um, if possible. Um, when we were down in Antarctica, I didn't have the opportunity to have the whales, but actually one of my colleagues did. Um, there were a couple humpbacks that were nearby and they were very curiously going in and around uh, the explorer boats. And when that type of situation happens, you know, it, it's just, let's stop all of the operation. Let's just not let this natural wildlife opportunity unfold. And that really is what's so special about expedition cruising is just being able to take advantage um, of those opportunities when they present themselves. And of course, right from our own ship, we will have lots of opportunity to cruise by um, and see icebergs. If you can believe it, this is a photo I took just from my iPhone um, on the top of our ship. Um, we were sailing through this beautiful channel called the Gullet, and it was just massive iceberg after massive iceberg. And, um, you know, because we had such great weather that day, our hotel manager decided, let's just throw a big barbecue up on the top deck, really just to sort of commemorate this amazing experience that we were witnessing on this beautiful blue sky day. And then, of course, we love to sort of find fun and different ways to commemorate your experience down in Antarctica. Now, this is optional. You don't have to do this. Um, but if you feel adventurous enough, um, and assuming, of course, the conditions are safe during the expedition, we will offer our guests the opportunity to try out the polar plunge. And uh, don't worry, we do give you the certificate to prove that it happened, because I feel like if Without that certificate, nobody would have believed me that I actually, you know, head fully under the water, um, decided to go for the uh, polar swim. And the water was about four degrees Celsius. The air temperature was three degrees um, when we were there. But um, my gosh, it's, you know, it's a certificate I proudly hang on my wall because even I can't believe that I did it. Um, but it is something that, if, you know, if you should feel up to it, um, you know, we will try to give our guests that opportunity as well. Now, we do have some optional activities um, for our guests. Now, these are the only things that really have an extra cost in destination. And reason being is, um, you know, we can only take so many people out at one time to do these activities. Um, we do have certain regulations that we need to follow from IATO um, with the number of people that we take out to do these activities. Um, but also, too, you know, we don't have... 500 kayaks for everybody to go out at one time. So we do it with, um, you know, small groups and with our kayak guides um, to really give our guests sort of an, an alternate option of something that they can experience in destination. Um, so there's three activities that we offer as an optional. Um, the first one is kayaking. And this is, again, a great opportunity where, you know, should water conditions and, and ice conditions permit, it's another great, great way to sort of get at water level and, and get a little bit more close and intimate with the surrounding ice. And if we're lucky, again, potentially a whale or maybe some swimming penguins. Um, we do also offer snowshoeing. And um, 
we do need a good base of snow to do snowshoeing and uh, the next activity, which is camping. Um, so if you do have an interest in either one of these activities, um, we actually need a good base of snow to do it and traveling towards the beginning of the season is the perfect time for us to be able to attempt these activities. Um, so your timing is perfect for when you're going to be going down. And um, yes, believe it or not, you could even experience overnight camping in the continent of Antarctica. Um, it's quite a neat experience where we, we are allowed to take 30 people out for overnight camping and we bring a tent for two expedition team members as well. And um, our captain will actually bring our ship into the landing area. Um, our guests will disembark with the camping gear and then the ship will disappear for the evening so that our group will really just be alone with maybe some penguins if they're nearby um, to enjoy the Antarctic, uh, you know, summer under the, the, the sunsets and um, kind of have that full on adventure. So of course, these three activities, um, they are only bookable on board. And the reason being, of course, we need good weather, sea and ice conditions in order to be able to operate them. So we can never guarantee that we can offer it you know, so many times throughout the cruise. And we also want to give everybody equal opportunity to put their name in to have the opportunity to participate, um, you know, rather than if you book early and it sells out before you even had the chance um, to try. Um, so those experiences we leave as a book on board option only. Now, you've heard me mention IATO, the International Association of Antarctic Tour Operators, and they are essentially the regulatory party that we are members of as an operator. And we all work together to set the rules on how to properly and safely operate in Antarctica because of course the Antarctic Treaty that was signed in 1959 designated the continent of Antarctica as a place for peace and science um, and it has thankfully stayed that way since so nobody has ownership no country has ownership of the continent and there are no permanent habitats on the Antarctic continent. There are, of course, you know, from multiple different countries, um, different researchers that do have bases throughout there, um, but nobody actually lives permanently full time uh, in Antarctica. So with that, there are certain rules that we need to follow um, when it comes to uh, how we can operate in Antarctica. And one of those is actually the capacity of your ship. Um, now, whether or not you knew, um, you might have seen some of the larger ship itineraries that have Antarctica included in their itineraries. But the difference between them and the Hurtigruten expeditions experience is that they are not allowed to actually step foot on land uh, because they have too many guests on board their ship. Um, so with the Hurtigruten expedition, um, because we fall within the category two and the category one size of ship, our guests have the full opportunity to step foot on land and truly immersively experience the continent of Antarctica. And another thing that we need to be very aware of when traveling in Antarctica is biosecurity, because of course we do not want um, to introduce any foreign contaminants to the continent. So before we actually ever go ashore and do our first landing, we have to vacuum our outer clothing layers. And that is to make sure that we re remove, you know, maybe any seeds or fluff or anything that might be stuck in your pockets or, you know, on the kind of cuff of your pants. Um, we want to make sure we remove all of that so that nothing will fall off of you and be introduced to Antarctica. And before we ever get into our zodiacs with our muck boots, we will walk through a disinfectant to make sure that any bacteria that is on the bottom of our boots um, is destroyed before we go ashore. And then once we have been ashore and are coming back onto our ship, we actually go through sort of a little boot car wash as well, making sure again that, you know, we, we do encounter some penguin poop along our way, um, that we make sure we wash that off of our boots um, before entering back onto the ship as well. Um, so biosecurity is a very, very important 
thing um, that we need to be following when in Antarctica, because if we break any of these rules as an operator, that can actually prevent you from operating for the rest of the season. And of course, um, you know, all of us want to be going down to this destination to have the opportunity to see wildlife, especially the penguins. I think they really are quite often the stars of the show. Um, but the rule that we do need to follow is maintaining that safe distance of five meters or 15 feet. And you can see that these guests, I mean, my gosh, they have done it perfectly um, when viewing this little group of Gen 2 penguins. But of course, we know, you know, the penguins don't know distances or anything like that. So it is sometimes possible that a penguin might break that barrier and choose to very curiously come up to one of our guests to check them out and see what's going on. Um, they are not scared of us. So it's our job as guests in their home to just sort of let them have full control of the situation. You know, we don't reach down and touch them. We don't scare them. Um, you know, we let them sort of just naturally do what they want to do. They might peck at your boot. They might try and grab your life jacket strap or something, um, but they'll eventually get bored of you and will waddle off. Um, we do quite often um, and fun encounters with wildlife. You can see this little fur seal pup. He decided to use our boot brush as uh, a little place to take an afternoon nap. Um, so there's multiple different types of penguin species that you'll have the opportunity to see. Expand your penguin list. Um, some of the most common are the Gentoo penguins, the Adelis, the chin straps. And of course, when it comes to the whales that we encounter, there are six or seven different types um, that we commonly see down in, in Antarctica. The humpbacks, especially killer whales. Um, and we also have fin whales, right whales, and of course, multiple different types of seals as well. Now we're traveling at the very beginning of the season. So your average temperatures kind of are between that minus nine to minus six degrees Celsius, which again, I think as Canadians, we can handle that no problem. But what's great about the beginning of the season is there's still a lot of you know floating sea ice and a lot of fresh snow because it's right at the beginning. Um, you know, it has hasn't quite, the temperatures haven't quite risen enough yet um, where we start to see a lot of that melt, which happens towards sort of the end of December into January timeframe. Now, towards the end of November, this is, you know, our penguins have gone through their courtship and their nest building and are protecting their eggs, um, which will eventually hatch a little bit later into the Antarctic season. And we see sort of a migration um, back down south by a lot of the different whales species because they use Antarctica for their summer feeding grounds. There is a high amount of krill um, that can be found in the areas that we are sailing. And of course, the beauty of being in the Falkland Islands at this time of year as well, along with a lot of the mating and courtship rituals that we'll witness with the different bird species, um, it's a beautiful time for the spring wildfire flowers that can be seen around the different landing sites that we have the chance to visit. So the ship that will be taking you for all of this adventure is the MS Rowell Amundsen. Um, she is the world's first hybrid electric powered ship. I had the chance to live on board her for a month um, last year. And I just, I was in tears leaving because I just absolutely, she was like my second home. Um, so some of the, you know, onboard comforts and things like that, uh, that can be found. Um, we have very comfortable and premium staterooms, um, beautiful onboard amenities these and lounges. But of course, you know, in given the landscape that we're in right now, um, we have updated and changed some of our health and safety protocols to ensure that, of course, the experience at the utmost, the highest priority is safety. Um, so throughout the 2022 expedition year, um, we are requiring all of our guests and our crew to be fully vaccinated. Um, for Canadians, yes, we do accept mixed vaccines. Um, and it's just a matter of ensuring with Argentina, since that is our main point of entry for the cruise, um, that we follow all of the entry requirements of the country where we are starting um, the expedition portion of the trip. 
And of course, currently we have removed buffet service center doing only served meals throughout. Again, these things may change, you know, as we see the situation change and evolve over the next year. But just to give you an idea of some of the things that we are doing currently, um, we of course have enhanced the cleaning and disinfecting protocols around the ship. We are currently requiring face masks on board. Um, if you are up on the top deck and are able to be, um, you know, safely disinfected, from others, you can remove your mask. Um, so far, we are requiring face masks in the Zodiac, but when we are ashore doing nature landings and we aren't, um, you know, visiting any research centers, there is the opportunity to take off the face mask there as well. And of course, we have full access to a medical team on board 24-7 and go through continuous monitoring of all of our crew and guests through things like temperature checks. And we do have PCR testing available on board um, should it be required if anybody shows any symptoms and that type of thing on board. So again, something like health and safety, again, as things continually evolve, um, we will make sure that we are always updating and providing um, Westworld tours with the most up-to-date information when it comes to health and safety um, as we get closer to your expedition. Um, we have a beautiful array of different types of staterooms and suites. And you can see, um, you know, we are very Scandinavian in um, our look and feel on board. Warm woolen blankets, beautiful warm toned woods. Um, we have faux fireplaces around the ship just to give that cozy sort of home away from home experience. Um, we are a casual experience on board. So although we are premium in nature, um, there's no dress code or anything like that um, on board. So we fully encourage, you know, comfort. And if you want to go to dinner in jeans and a sweater, that is completely okay with us. We have beautiful lounge areas on board and always access to floor to ceiling windows because of course you never know what's going to happen on the outside. We want to give our guests full opportunity to have access to the beautiful views. And of course, we've got um, three fantastic restaurants on board and a, a beautiful lounge and bar area. Um, the only uh, restaurant, Lindstrom, that is the only one that does have an extra cost. It is included for suite guests. Um, it has a 25 euro per person charge um, as a specialty restaurant. So it's something you can use, you know, to maybe celebrate a certain occasion or just to have something different. Um, but the Explorer Lounge, Auna and Freydholm are part of the included experience on board. Perfect. Thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing that. That's really uh, exciting, that expedition. And Coral, I'll turn it over to you and you can uh, talk about your photos. All right, uh, Kristen, I was enjoying listening to you talk so much you could have kept talking. <laughs> it was great. Um, but you did uh, make me think of some things that I wanted to share. And uh, I won't take long, everyone, but uh, um, I just want to share a little bit of my personal experiences uh, traveling uh, in Antarctica. I'm sure there are several of you listening tonight that I've had the pleasure of traveling with in the past and some that I haven't. Um, but uh, I have been very blessed to travel uh, to Antarctica. Uh, it's uh, it's a few years ago since I was there, but these are a couple of my photos of myself in Antarctica. Um, I visited the Falkland Islands as well, had the chance to stop at South Georgia, and then visited some islands in the continent uh, of Antarctica too. So see me with some of the penguins there. And uh, I think um, all the stories that I like to tell of my experiences in Antarctica, it all kind of comes back to one thing for me. When I was on that ship, and it was actually a rush an icebreaker uh, with an American tour group that I was traveling on when I visited, uh, we used the word surreal like it was going out of style, but it was so true. Everything was surreal and it just became just such a part of our vocabulary every day. Uh, but it was surreal, but it also was an incredibly unique experience in that I don't think I've ever had another time in my life where it just felt like time completely stopped. And it really did. Uh, from the time we left Uswaya until the time we returned, it was almost like the rest of the world didn't exist. And uh, it really, it really was. It was, it was as though time stopped. Um, I was thinking too about what you said, Chris, 
Kristen, about, uh, you know, weather and uh, the staff on board and, you know, being being flexible with landings and everything that the do that the staff do to help you at those various landings. I remember our staff taking gear off the ship and all the work that they did just in case, you know, the weather kicked up and for some reason we couldn't get back onto uh, onto our ship when, they, when we'd planned to. So um, just incredible experiences, uh, the care uh, that the staff provide on a trip like this and uh, you really do learn to put uh, you know put your your everything in uh, in their hands and uh, and they take such good uh, such good care um on the topic of uh, surreal and uh, thinking about uh, the photos that you shared Kristen of uh, of those icebergs as well too um I think one of my favorite stories to tell of my trip was one of those days when uh, you know the weather kicked up and uh, we weren't able to get off of our ship uh, onto those zodiacs um it actually looked like quite a nice day the sun was even shining but we just weren't able to uh, to make land and uh, it had just so happened that the geologist on board the ship I was with uh was also a tai chi instructor so there we were uh cruising through Antarctica excuse me through Antarctica with gigantic tabular icebergs all around us doing tai chi on the top deck of the ship and that will always live in my memory as uh, as one of the most surreal, magical experiences of my life. And uh, certainly another one of the magical experiences for me was indeed uh, the wildlife. And uh, I agree with what you said about the penguins being the stars. Um, I was fortunate to see a handful of different uh, penguin species. I was actually lucky uh, to see the uh, the wonderful uh, king penguins too, whom I thought really like to sing. They're not, they're not, they're not songbirds, that's for sure, but, but they're really enthusiastic and beautiful. Um, I love the little Adelis uh, and the chin strap. I, I think the uh, the Gentoos were one of my favorites and uh, every penguin species is a little bit unique from the next. Uh, the fur seals, I saw Weddell seals, even had incredible experience with a leopard seal, the predator uh, of Antarctica one day too. And uh, I remember a day when a whale actually came up right underneath our, uh, our ship and there were four or five of us lucky enough to be standing on deck as that whale came up and we just ran screaming like little four-year-old girls. We were so excited, just running to the other end of the ship, uh, trying to see this whale again. So uh, the wildlife is, uh, I know that maybe goes with saying but it's such a magical part of uh, anyone's trip to uh, to Antarctica is the wildlife. I had a crazy experience in the Falkland Islands in the town of Stanley of running into uh, some former Westworld passengers, some friends, uh, some good friends from Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan and actually just out of nowhere ran into them in the Falkland Islands. So uh, that was uh, a crazy experience and a lovely memory as well. Um, I did do the polar plunge as well. And I remember also that we were told full immersion, your hair had better be wet when you come out of the water. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I did the polar plunge as well. And I agree with you, Kristen, I'm very proud of that certificate. It still hangs on my wall today too. So you really intrigued me with uh, the camping. Um, I didn't get to go camping. I want to go camping now uh, in Antarctica. I think that would be uh, a lot of fun. And uh, what I did do was I made a snow angel. I remember thinking, um, you know, if I'm in Antarctica anyways, I better make a snow angel while I'm here. So uh, so I did that. But uh, thank you for letting me share a little bit of that. And uh, uh, everyone who's listening to us tonight and sharing our presentation, I can't tell you enough what an incredible experience that is. Uh, there's few other words that can really describe it properly other than to say, uh, it is surreal and it truly is a one of a lifetime experience and most definitely it is a magical experience more than I can say in words so uh, thank you for the time and uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be a part of the presentation tonight. Thank you Coral and thank you Kristen. Uh, now you've really got me uh, itching to go so um, anyway I just want to thank everyone else for joining us this evening and uh, again, both of you for joining us and sharing this incredible once in a lifetime experience uh, with everyone tonight. And uh, we look forward to the tour going uh, in the fall of next year. Um, so now we will answer some of the questions here. Oh, now I'm getting, oh, sorry, I'm getting carried away here. 
There we go. Okay. So we, I'm going to have a look here and see if we have any questions. Okay, we had some issues with sound. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so someone asked how much of the West Coast will be seen. Um, that I'm not sure if that was directed to this. Does that sound familiar to either of you? West Coast? <laughs> no, okay. I'm not sure. No. Yeah, no, that doesn't. Okay. Um, oh, let's see here. We have another. Any solo opportunities? Uh, so, hi, Joan. Yes, we do have some solo opportunities on this tour. Uh, you'll want to contact your local travel agent or give us a call, and we can uh, definitely check space. Solo uh, cabins are based on availability. And uh, the sooner you book, the, the better chance you have of being able to uh, get a cabin. Okay. I think that if no one else has any other questions, I guess we'll wrap it up. They're just in so that. much awe with everything <laughs> they've heard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's one of those yeah. things where you let it all settle in and then people I think will start to think of some questions <laughs> after the fact. For sure. Yeah. And and that is that's great. Um, someone asked, what is the cost? So Alan, you can find the cost on our website. Uh, we will also be emailing all the details uh, to you as well. And I also uh, just wanted to thank everyone um, for joining. We will be sending out an email tomorrow that will have uh, mm -hmm. the link to the, to the recording if you weren't able to stay for the whole thing um, or wanna share it with uh, your traveling companion. Um, the cost you can find on our website, you can contact us at information at westworldtours.com. Actually, if I just get to that slide here, I'll just go through them all here and uh, get right to the end and then you'll have the contact information. And uh, yeah, you can contact us or contact your local travel agent for more questions. And there we go. So you can visit us online at westworldtours.com. You can email us at information at westworldtours.com. Follow us on Facebook or contact your local travel agent. And uh, like I said, we will be sending out an email tomorrow afternoon uh, with the itinerary and more information on uh, this tour and all of our other tours. And so once again, thank you all for joining us. And a big thank you to Kristen and Coral for joining us and sharing the Antarctica experience and our South America tour. And uh, we hope everyone found this uh, presentation informative. And um, we hope to see you on.